What's up, everybody? Welcome to this lecture in cell biology. So today we are going to be starting off with cell sorting using FACS. Now that is fluorescent activated cell sorting. Okay, so when using uh, this method, FACS, we, we use uh, antibiotics conjugated to fluorophores, and we can use these antibiotics to target things on the outside of cells only. Antibiotics cannot pass cell membranes. Keep that in mind. So if we know what proteins are expressed on the outside of cells that we want to target, we can use this method. So basically, cell sorting is um, when we figure out that we want a certain type of cell, it's obviously very difficult to isolate a cell. And using FACCS, we can do this. So we use uh, antibiotics that are attached with fluorophores so that we can see them. And they uh, give, up, give off a certain fluorescent color. And we then... We target these proteins by understanding what, or we, we, we target these cells by understanding what proteins are on the surface area of the cell. And then we use these antibodies to bind. And then with the fluorophores, we can see where it is bound and which cells have these fluorophores will then be the cells that we are looking for. So we can then use a cell sorting apparatus that has a tube. So a tube right here, allowing cells to pass through in a single file, as shown here. Cells are passing through in a single file. And a light of specific wavelength is sent down the tube, which excites cells going through, but only the cells labeled with fluorophores. So these guys here, the green and the, and the red, are cells that want to be that we want targeted. And they're not normal. They get excited by this wavelength. And then computer software registers which cells have high fluorescence and is configured in a way that when a high fluorophore cell passes through, the end of the tube charge is applied that may be strong enough to move it into a target container. So these target containers down here will take in the cells. And the strength of the charge is proportional to the cell degree of fluorescence. So the more fluorescence, the higher the charge. The charge is here on these plates. And the cells will come down, and the charge will bring them towards each plate. And the higher the charge, the further they will go to the plate, the easier it will be for them to get into these containers. And the lower the, the, uh, the fluoresce from these cells, the lower the charge that will uh, be inflicted on them. And the greater possibility they won't make it into these containers. We then take these containers, and these containers are the cells that we are looking for, which is awesome. That's, that's what we want. So we can then take these cells and do experiments with them. And so when we take these cells and do experiments with them, we end up with, uh, or sorry, when we, when we finish this uh, FACS um, experiment, we can end up with a scatter plot that looks something like this. So each dot is a cell, and we can see that these individual cells have ended up in different places depending on the proteins that are on their cell surface, which has a certain color fluorophore, green, red, blue, and it has put them into certain positions. And we can see that these cells are, in fact, different from each other. We have lymphocytes, monocytes, and neutrophils, all in different colors. And we have isolated these, and we can now move on to doing um, certain experiments that we want. So now here, I'm going to move on here to uh, Hoich stain, which is a very interesting um, thing uh, used in uh, modern cell biology, in modern experiments. Um, so we can use Hoich stain that can transfer... This, so the stain, the stain can transfer past uh, membranes, and it is a blue dye, and it will attach 
into the nucleus onto DNA strands. And of course, the more DNA strands in the nucleus, the uh, the more blue will be found in the um, in the cells. More places to attach. <laughs> so shown here, the Hoyt stain shows how much DNA is present in the cell at a certain time. And we have the legend here, and we can look, and we can say, hey, yeah, at this point here, in red, this is the sub-G1 phase, and we actually know that cells do not spend much time in sub-G1, and so there were not many cells in this stage when we used this Hoysch stain, and so there wasn't much DNA in total found in the stage. Now we move on to G0, G1, and this is a stage where most cells uh, sit for most of the time. So if we were to think and we were to um, throw this Hoysch stain into a bunch of cells at any time, what, um, what cell stage would these cells be in, most likely? Well, I mean, 80-90% of the cells, cell, uh, the time that a cell spends is in uh, G0, G1 phase. So this is a correct representation of how much DNA would be found in G0, G1 for a bunch of cells because most of them are in this stage here. And now looking here is an S phase, not much going on with DNA. And then an interesting little bump here is in G2. And this is the stage where the cell uh, replicates its uh, DNA. And that is why we have a slight jump here. And it's a very interesting way of uh, figuring out how much DNA is in the cell at a time. So moving on here now, um, what if we want to isolate organelles? So we've found the cells that we want. Now what if we want to isolate the organelles from them? Well, first step is to break the cell membrane. And when we break the cell membrane, um, there are different ways of doing this. We can do uh, mechanical homogenization. We can use sonication, which is also uh, known as ultrasound. We can... Um, pressure these cells through a narrow valve. We can use non-ionic detergents, such as Triton X. And we can place cells in a hypotonic solution. These are all options. You can study up on them more. I will not go th through them in detail in this lecture, but they are definitely the options that we use. Now moving on to um, how do we separate these organelles now? So we've been able to get the organelles um, out of the uh, cell membrane, and now, now we've got to figure out how to separate these organelles. So um, the first method here, the, I'm showing two methods, uh, first method here, second method here. The first method is uh, differential centrifugation. So what happens is we put these, uh, we put a tube of all the organelles into a centrifuge, and we we let it continue through the uh, process of centrifugation, and we'll see that, yes, the heavier, the heavier um, organelles will end up at the bottom. And now what we can do is we can leave this pallet of organelles in this tube, and we can take out the pallet of um, stuff that has not quite condensed to the bottom yet and move it into this pallet. And then we'll up the speed on the centrifuge, and then other cells will fall to the bottom. And then we can take this top part, bring it in here, and then centrifuge again at a higher speed. Stuff will separate, got a pallet, and bring in the rest over here. Now go at an even higher speed in the centrifuge. And then these cells will separate. And now you have separated all the organelles. And there are certain organelles that will be found in each stage. Um, as shown here, uh, So in this first pallet, it's showing uh, whole cells um, and cytoskeletons can be found in this pallet. Um, mitochondrial isosomes can be found in this pallet. Microsomes and other small vesicles can be found in this pallet. And ribosomes and viruses and large macromolecules can be found in this pallet. Now, what if we want to find a specific organelle? 
So we've been able to separate the organelles here in differential centrifugation. But now what if we want a separate organelle? We want to separate it completely. Well, then we're going to want to use... Then we're going to want to use equilibrium density gradient centrifugation. And that is shown here on the right. So we can take a one of these pallets and we can... So if we want a specific cell, we know which pallet the cell... Or if we want a specific organelle, sorry, we know which pallet the organelle will be found in. We can use that pallet and we can overlay it with a sucrose gradient from a low to high concentration. Now, when we centrifuge, organelles will migrate into, sucrose, into the sucrose gradient and the bands that they form are equal to equilibrium density, which mim mimics their own density level. So there's the sucrose implanted in here, and it's at certain densities, very, very close densities. And what happens is we know that these, like, for example, lysosomes, mitochondria, and peroxisomes, they definitely do have a different density for each of them. And what we've done with the sucrose uh, layer here is that it's so close in densities that we are, we are actually able to pinpoint where these um, individual organelle layers end up. And so we can see these bands form, and we know that lysosomes here have made it into this band, mitochondria, and peroxidomes into this band. And now these organelles are separated, and we can use them for what we need to do. So now moving on here, how are proteins separated from the organelle? So you may think, um, if you have um, some sort of knowledge of how proteins embed themselves into um, organelle membranes and such. Um, they're, we know that they're very difficult to get out um, of the membrane, especially without damaging, jam damaging them or anything like that. So the best way to do this is to use detergents. And um, the detergents that we use are non-ionic and ionic detergents. And they're amphipathic. Ampi ampi in um, orientation here, meaning that they do have a polar end and a non-polar end. So non-ionic um, detergents down here, um, using the hydrophilic domain that they have, can disrupt organelle membranes. Proteins stay intact, and it's, a, it's good at puncturing membranes and preserving uh, the protein. So that's what these non-ionic detergents are good at. Ionic detergents, on the other hand, are stronger detergents. They can disrupt the membrane and proteins and cause them to unfold. They can also disrupt protein interactions, denaturing detergents. So if we take an ionically uh, denatured sample and can then and then SDS code it, the proteins. We SDS coat the proteins and place proteins on a gel and apply an electrical field. Small proteins travel farther faster and large don't. So, so we take these proteins and we SDS coat them, which is just some sort of coat that applies a more negative charge to them. And basically all we're doing is putting them in a western blot. And I'm sure you've all heard of this before, how to detect a specific protein. So we apply this SDS just a bit of um, electric uh, negative charge here on these proteins, and we throw them into these... Uh, these compartments here on the top, and we let them go through, and the small proteins end up further down, and the big proteins end up higher. Now, we apply a, a, a stain or a dye <coughs> to detect the proteins so that we can see them. And we will end up seeing bands that represent proteins. And then we can then use molecular markers to see actual size of proteins. So we can use a, a like a ladder marker, which is a commonly used uh, marker, and it will just be on the side here. And we can just say, oh, this is um, however many kilodaltons um, in size. 
and this one is however many, and this one is however many. It's just a good way to see the actual size of proteins, because it is easy to um, understand the size when you, we're using a specific gel that we've already used before, and we know the properties of it, and how proteins um, interact with it and move through it. So by Western blotting here, um, we then move these um, the proteins from an SDS gel onto just a, a, a membrane gel here, or not a membrane gel, but a membrane. And then we incubate with uh, primary antibodies, and they will bind to specific proteins. So this is exactly how we detect a specific protein. And before I was just saying how we kind of separate the proteins, and um, we can determine the size before. But now we're actually detecting a specific protein. So we apply these primary antibodies shown here, and they attach to the specific protein of interest. We, we then, sorry about that, we then um, apply secondary antibodies, which are attached to fluorofluoros in most cases now, and in, in the modern uh, way of doing this. The fluorofluoros um, attach to the primary antibodies, and they emit a, fluoresce, a fluorescent light, and we can see them in microscope um, where they end up. And as shown, um, we can easily see where these, uh, where the proteins of interest um, have ended up on this uh, membrane here. And that is how you detect a specific protein. And uh, thanks everybody for watching this lecture, and I hope you learned some. See ya.